you can't wait to go on a drive in this thing, huh? Hop in. Let's go on a drive. So this is episode two. We're making more progress today. The engine's coming out and we're gonna do some work on it. Got the axle shafts removed and, oh, what is this? Is that somebody's shoe? Yep. The whole steering, the rack and pinion is held on by a shoe bottom, bailing wire, and it gets even more fancy when you get under here because there's a bungee cord and some more bailing wire. You know it's gonna be a fun project when it starts out like that. So I've got pretty much everything pulled off and I'm gonna drop it out the bottom. What do you think could happen if I uh, cut the motor mount belling wire system right here? You think it's just going to fall? <laughs> We're going to find out. But got a couple bolts to remove. We got a motor mount that's non existent right here, metal on metal. Uh, one right here, and then one at the back. We'll let it down. There it goes, it's down. One of the reasons I didn't want to take it through the top is then I did remove the, the rest of the exhaust manifold, but then I had to remove the master cylinder, brake cylinder, stuff like that. You ready for this? Water pump. After it's been sitting for 30 years. Look at that. Gross. This may have been the, uh, I can see the weep hole right here and I see a lot of buildup and corrosion around here. Either this was one of the reasons it was parked because the, you know, the water pump went out and it's not an easy water pump to replace really without removing the engine. You can do it. It's just, I mean, it's something that nobody would look forward to. But that could have been one of the reasons why this was parked. There's virtually no coolant in it, but this water pump right now is shot, obviously. So it's time to put that on the parts list as well. What do you think, Ginger? Good idea? Sure. So we've got the engine out. Give you a little bit of a walk around. The rear motor mount completely ripped. You can see this, uh, I mean, this right here is a shining achievement. Some thick belling wire. It took somebody a decent amount of time working in awkward positions get that wrapped up but well, obviously we're gonna have to fix that so I'm gonna actually pressure wash it now get it all cleaned up I had no idea that the original color of these blocks I don't know if you can see it, it's green it's like a John Deere green who knew apparently Volkswagen guys so we'll just pressure wash her up clean her up and go from there didn't clean up too bad let's see the color it's kind of like a John Deere and a like an army green kind of mixed I don't know okay playing around with the head I'm inspecting all the valves I actually had this valve right here was actually bent and so that took me 45 minutes or something to straighten out but I got it straight yes you can straighten valves so it's straight sealing good I decided just to go over the rest and lap the rest um, some of them were kind of sticking um, I don't know didn't have a uh, valve spring compressor the right size so I made a quick adjustable one um, you can see just from scrap just there you can adjust the width um, top is just a pair of vice grips but we can get it on there and remove the last valve and get it done keepers one of the easiest ways to check for a bent valve is put it in a drill spin it look at that top that's nice and straight second on get your hose get your drill use your finger to push it in Thank you. 
you really want to know how to unbend a valve, it's pretty basic. They actually bend pretty easy. They're actually pretty soft metal. Put a flashlight in there, look through the different holes, see which way it's bent, which side has, you know, rotate it, rotate it, mark it, and you can actually get a screwdriver in there, and you can actually just pry it over. Try not to damage the seat. Shin it though, it's really hard. And just usually you have to bend it a little bit more than you want. Check again, check again, check again. Take it out, put a straight edge on the shaft, see where it's bent at. But generally, you can get it. A little bit of finagling. I got that one, I got this one perfectly straight. It's between 15 and 20 thousandths. Somewhere in there, you can't get it perfectly. But we can bend that back and I'm gonna show you um, that and the the other surface we are if I recall about seven thousandths maybe eight eight starts to move it so it's about eight thousandths warped in the middle take a straight edge this is my skinniest one, which is one and a half thousandth. I know that's not factory, so Somebody's been in here before, so likely it has a new clutch, and there's a little metal plate, you can't, can't see on the bottom, but it's all bent up, you'll see in a minute. So, the transmission and engine have been apart before in its 127,000 miles, so likely I have a brand new clutch in there. So, let's remove the two bolts and find out. I'll give it to Volkswagen for using the fasteners that nobody else used. 11 millimeter. I don't know if my 11 millimeter socket's ever been used, but we're missing a bolt here. So it's either broke off or uh, it's not sitting in the bottom, but here's our bolts. You know, five out of six ain't bad. And let's see our clutch. We are a that's a good clutch. Nothing wrong with that clutch at all. Volkswagen definitely does stuff different <laughs> than I'm used to with the domestic cars. Just the way the pressure plate and everything else is kind of it's on the inside versus on the outside. Okay, ready? Sit. Oh, which one is it? Get it. Ah, I fooled you. Stop. Leave it. Leave it. It's right there. See it? Leave it. Okay, ready? You see it? Okay, get it. No, oh, oh, you're fooled. Good and tight. Cleaned. It cleaned up pretty good. I painted it a, um, it's normal color is kind of like a John Deere green. This is kind of more of a 
a lighter shade of green. This is just what I had laying around. I think it looks way better. I test painted it with some John Deere green I had sitting around. It just looked like I painted an engine that's not supposed to be a John Deere or John Deere. It's kind of an industrial green, about the same colors, like my lathe or something else like that. But the head is just sitting on there. I'm waiting for parts. And so I'm kind of at a stalemate. Um, just kind of got stuff mocked up, cleaned up everything on it clean the injectors everything else um just all cleaned up polished up just waiting for parts the the transmission cleaned up the transmission while i'm waiting uh, i do have to replace a little seal right here that seems to be pissing out fluid but um other than that and drill out some this is where the axles bolt on and it seems that half of them there's a broken off stud in half of them that i didn't do i wondered why it was only held on by three bolts but that's why so i guess while i'm Waiting for uh, one in particular company to deliver me parts. We'll move on to actually working on one of the biggest problems I see, and that is the um, the blue gloves sitting on the end of the things. Now, the steering with the shoe leather holding it on. Uh, I don't think you could get in there before. The reason they got it all wrapped up is because um, you couldn't get a drill or anything in there. But let's get under there and look at that and tackle that. Now let's see if this does it justice. So this is where the steering shaft comes from the steering wheel, comes out to the rack and pinion, and it, this is a piece of shoe leather. This is Britannia, and it's wrapped around, and then there's another piece of shoe leather right here that's wrapped around, and there's bailing wire that was supposed to be over it, and it looks like this bracket right here is what's supposed to hold that whole assembly on, and the bottom side is broken off, and the top side bolt is stripped or broken so it looks like the top bolt broke and it caused this to bend down and it broke off the bottom bracket so whew. so we can take off the, the bottom part of the bracket that's still attached and weld it back on and then the top up here it looks like there's actually a broken off drill bed in it or something so they tried to drill it out and kind of can't had to come down at an angle broke off a drill bit so we'll do that and so reattach that and this whole shoe leather debacle will be over. So this top bolt, um, it's actually a captive bolt behind. So it's a bolt like this behind this plate that I can't get to with the head sheared off. So I just, the head's still there, it doesn't move at all. It's nice and sturdy. So I drilled through it and just tapped it. And so now the head of the bolt is now a nut for this 5 16 not metric putting a standard bolt in there but that goes in there nice now and we welded this back up and I think the only reason this broke is because it bent down but I reinforced the welds a little bit on there put that cushion back on but that should all slide back to how it should go let's see if we can get that out of there right now that. you don't see that every day remove all this belling wire and this uh, contraption under here with the bungee cord and stuff like that. Right, Ginger? Right? We're good to go? Yeah, I didn't even realize that the, uh, I think the shifter mecha the shifter is actually bolted to that, is welded to that as well, so that I'm sure the shifter was just sloppy, sloppy as well. This has to be one of the most neglected vehicles I've ever seen. So this is part of the, I was looking at the uh, shift linkage, and this right here is supposed to have a big old, like a nylon ball um, around it and it fits inside like a housing and the ball just kind of keeps and it's about, probably about that wide about that much slop off of it so I just took the old motor mount that I'm throwing away the rubber's still good and we'll just take that and I just quickly just kind of carved it into a ball and we'll just insert it in there with a little bit of super glue just kind of shave it down into a ball shape it doesn't need to be perfect it pretty much just takes up slop and kind of softens the shift this is pretty hard rubber uh, I don't think you'll notice it and if it does, we'll just replace it later. Put a little grease on there. Another slide in there. A little slippery. <laughs> so I just soldered up a Sucky 2000 bottle. Just two little metal fittings. And they're just soldered to it through the lid. I can hook my mighty back to it. And we see what the diesel fuel looks like. And I'll just leave that filter on there. It's better than nothing. Because I have a new filter, but 
This is what 30 year old, 25, 30 year old diesel looks like. It smells a little bit, like a teeny bit like old gas, but like, not really. So, I mean, old gas reeks, this doesn't. It was starting to get a little tiring, so I made this years ago out of an old um, like house AC unit for vacuuming AC systems and stuff like that. So I just got that plugged into the gas can. Just kind of one side wedged on. The other side's doing the same thing. It's collapsing my gas can. It's pulling so hard. So the tank's empty. So now I'm going to pour in some good diesel until it pulls up the good diesel. And I think we'll be good. we're good well I have to take out the valve that I straightened even though I straighten this it's too short for the shims to work to adjust these valves they use these little um, pucks different thicknesses of pucks that sit up on here and that fills up your clearances and the valve because it was bent it actually smashed this I mean we're talking next to nothing but just barely outside of spec that I can't um, shim it there's not shims available that will adjust it. So even though this valve I straightened perfectly, it's not gonna work. But I painted up my valve spring compressor. So you guys can see that. So I'm gonna stick it on, stick it on. Snug up the back bolt, just barely. Just tighten it up by hand real fast. One keeper, two keepers. Loosen it off. And the springs can come out, or the valve can come out. So old valve, new valve. And you see it's fattened up just a little bit right there. I think it just barely smashed it. So put the new valve in. This one's just a little bit longer, it looks like. We'll measure them, but that one goes in. Same as reverse. This is my rusted cylinder. This one took the most work and it is probably a little over what it should be for stock piston rings. Um, there's a, just a teeny bit of pitting, but mainly just down at the very bottom where it was stuck and maybe a little bit up halfway here. The top seems pretty clear where the compression is the most. This one, actually there's quite a, there was quite a bit of, you couldn't feel them, but um, up and down score you can see right there you couldn't actually feel them but I tried to clean them up as good as possible this looks like a ridge but it's really not a ridge um, thing is I don't want to remove more than I need to this one was the least and kind of it kind of goes from least to, to most so this one is but yeah I didn't have to really remove anything this one just a teeny bit more this one's a teeny bit more that one the most um, we're not building race cars we're building a super slow Dog of an engine, VW diesel. Just get it built, get it running. Last thing I want is piston slap. Not that you'd be able to hear it in an old clanky diesel like this, but it was just a little excessive. So they used to do this all the time in race car engines, stuff like that. Um, they still do it. It's called piston knurling. Uh, and there's a special machine. There was machines made for this. Uh, you could take them in and they would knurl your pistons for you. Take out any slop. You put in a, uh, usually you keep the same size piston. You put a 10,000 ring over, grind the end ring gap just right, and you just knurl your piston and get you by. And there's no issues with it. But I don't have a knurling machine, so we're going to get a little creative and we're going to dimple it. This is just a, uh, like a, a center punch. And we just put it there. It leaves a dimple. I didn't leave a dimple. Leaves a dimple. We sand it down to with like some really fine sandpaper, 320, even finer than that. And what that does is just raises the surface just enough so that when this goes in here, it just doesn't slop. They don't do this, nobody does this anymore. Uh, some people do in their own garages, but 
this also theoretically carries more oil on the skirt and lubricates it better and actually works better than just having a perfectly smooth skirt. Theoretically, um, you can bash me for that red necky bit, but we're gonna do it on number four. Don't think I'm gonna do it on number three. I might do a couple on number three. We won't do it on these two because they don't need it. But that'll just that just keeps it from the piston from slapping around too much. So I just barely got off the phone with Guinness and it is official. This is the world's smallest seal. That little guy right there. Apparently this is actually leaking. When I tipped it, it was leaking. I thought it was actually this seal around here. So I ordered one of those as well. Um, but I'm not sure if it's leaking or not. So I'm going to break a rule that I have and that is never ever replace a seal if it's not leaking. So I don't know if it's leaking or not, but we're going to replace it because generally if you replace a seal that isn't leaking, the new seal you put in will leak. It's just the way stuff goes. So it should be pretty straightforward. We're gonna use the, this is not a screwdriver, this is a special pry tool. It's not really. I love when I get crap about using screwdrivers. They haven't made, flathead screws have been obsolete for nearly 50 years. You know, I know they still make them, but for the most part, it's. They're obsolete, but they still make flathead screws, screwdrivers, because everybody uses them for this purpose. And I'm not gonna be able to get enough leverage in there to get that out, so. I just popped right out, and boy, is it brittle. I mean, that is crispy. It's starting to come, there we go, boom. I heated it up just a little bit and we're out. So the cylinder head was pretty warped and I straightened it out and straightened out the camshaft. I did a completely separate video on that if you saw it. So, um, and then I sanded, I decked the top so it was bent back and decked. Uh, these little marks are nothing. They are just stains. So it is flawlessly flat within under half a thousand. We've got a new head gasket, ready to assemble everything. But I thought, you know, this kind of is giving up a little bit more of its life story. You can see valve kisses on every single one. And this third valve, yep, I put a smiley face on that one. This third valve in was actually bent and I replaced that. I think this engine kissed every single valve from a timing belt break. And the actual timing belt idler pulley seems brand new along with the timing belt. Um, this is the timing belt I pulled off and it's still, I can read manufacturer name, everything else. So this hasn't been on there that long. Uh, and actually there's no cracking in it or anything. So this hasn't rode for 127,000 miles. On the inside, there's little ridges, um, kind of go at a 45 and none of those are worn off. So this is a new timing belt, probably under 5,000 miles or something. So this likely broke um, and they replaced the timing belt and maybe none of these valves were were you know bent to the point that they caused any damage maybe the engine kind of stopped up and only this one was bent so they put the timing belt on and then just ran like crap really underpowered i don't know but it's time to put new head gasket on so the, the top is flat we got our new head gasket here now's the fun First torqued it, torqued it to 35 newton meters, that's 26 foot pounds. Then 60 newton meters, 44 foot pounds. And then 90, and then 90. So I did 190. Now I gotta do the second 90. The first 90 took it up to about um, almost 100 foot pounds. So it's getting tight. So we gotta do it again. And then supposedly according to the spec sheet, then we gotta start the engine, run the engine. Do a, another 90 then drive a thousand kilometers and then do another 90. That's crazy. It just seems so crazy. So I just have a digital torque meter on there because I'm just curious how bloody tight this is. 
Um, oh my gosh! 134. That's like scary. I would. That's like scary tight. How. Hundred twenty, you know, it's just it just seems <laughs> way tighter than it should be, but that's head bolts for you. So I think I got it all timed correctly. Everything seems good. Um, these have a problem. This this shaft right here behind this plate is called an intermediate shaft, and that runs like the oil pump and the and the um, air pump, and so that those bearings wear out. Mine seemed good, and I. The general consensus is because this is too tight, the tensioner. And so I have that to a point that I think is loose enough. Uh, if I get slack in between those, there we go. Uh, I keep springing back. If I get slack in between those, you know, I think we're good. We can turn it a little bit past 45. But I guess bolted some accessories on, everything else on. Um, I think we're about ready to put the oil pan Oil pan gasket on. Getting heavy. Oh yeah, it is. Wow. That's a wrist breaker if you're not ready for it. So now I just set the injection pump timing. Um, I marked a little mark down here for top dead center, but I made a better one over here with a little pointer on the flywheel. Since I don't have the clutch plate on there and the transmission, you can't really see. But uh, what I did was this actually requires a special tool, but it's essentially just a dial indicator that pushes on the center of the injection pump. So I just took a dial indicator and took out the little tip, there's a little screw-in tip, and I just set a piece of copper wire in there, um, like household 14 gauge, but left a little plastic sheath on it, and put my magnetic base, and I'll just magnetic it right to the side of the injection pump. Normally you do this in the car, but it's set at zero. We backed it off and then we rotated the direction that the engine would run and then it'll press up and we come until we hit exact top dead center right there and I'm at 39 thousandths which is roughly 0.99 slash one millimeter so we should be good that's a, a little over spec it was set at 0.8 millimeters um which would have been under spec but reading on the forums everybody's tuning them up to 1.05 millimeters but we're gonna stay just a little bit lower than that and but probably gonna have to play with it and that's if the injection pump's even good. What could go wrong? Swinging engine, heavy transmission, lining up a clutch. Let's do it. Look at that. One shot. Wrong bolt. So there it sits, all nice and pretty. Right, Ginger? Yeah. So now it's a matter of lowering the truck down onto it and then pulling it up into place. Uh, still waiting for some parts, like the shift linkage that's all belling wired together. Apparently two and a half weeks is not ample time to wait. You need to wait even longer than that. So took apart the CV axle joints, greased the crap out of those. Um, this one had zero boot, but when I took it apart, it looks good. And I made my, own, made my own little rubber boot that may or may not hold up. We'll find out. Just get it by. The outside boots are good, decent. Um, but now, let's just drop it down. Pull this shiny little thing right up into place.
this up because these hey. Out with the old, in with the new. Now I just gotta transfer all the duct tape from this one over to that one. I think that was a problem. Kinda wanna unwrap it and see what's under there. But we got our getting her topped up with some water. Just water. I'm sure I have some hose leaks somewhere. I'm sure of it. And then let's just dump in a bunch of oil. We got one of these annoying side post batteries. I think this one will actually take top post, but this is the battery I'm sitting around right now. This one looks nice and crusty. So does this one. Does that fit on there? Nope. Nice and busted. So we just squeeze it in a little bit. Cut wedges on. Hammer it a little bit. There we go. No sparky sparky. So if you bring in here, there's actually, yep, that's a screwdriver. Yeah, I had to drill out the lock cylinder, had no keys with it, to unlock the steering wheel to be able to load it. So uh, let's see what happens if I click it. Yeah, we get a audible, some sort of relay is clicking. But if I click it to start, nothing. I might have to push in the clutch. We'll try that and see if we can get this thing to crank. So when I turn the key, we're getting 12 volts to the solenoid on the injection pump. I'm um, still getting no cranky cranky, so we'll just bypass the starter manually. Uh, I got all the lines barely cracked. So we gotta bleed the, um, the injection lines. So let's just crank it for a minute. We're gonna run a battery down. Looks like we've got to give the starter a couple wacky wackies. It's a little rusty. Well, poo. Gotta play around with that for a minute. So I pulled the starter out, thinking that another Volkswagen starter they had would fit, and it doesn't. Uh, an 84 Vanagon VW bus does not fit in there and so what's happening is the uh people bash fords because they have a separate starter solenoid but then you just replace the starter solenoid instead of the whole thing essentially the starter solenoid isn't bridging the positive from here to here um this serves two functions is one function is it pushes out the bendix and the other one it spit puts power down here and it spins the motor so i'm having two, two different functions i'm having to jump the starter, the uh, Bendix out, and then rotate it with wires. Come on, Dick. I should glow plug it. You just go until the wire you're using to short the glow plugs gets warm. Or too hot out, too hot to handle. Come on, keep going. Ready? Let's go. Some more. Woo! You guys see that? It tried.
The graveyard of parts, timing belts, duct tape overflow tanks, the rustiest water pumps ever, head bolts, busted piston rings. And not all of them are for me, prying them off. Um, there was a fair amount that were just broken by themselves. So if this thing did run, it ran like crap, especially with that bent valve. Um, seals, filters, more belts, head gaskets, um, broken motor mounts. Every single motor mount was broken and held on by bailing wire. And of course, the soles of shoes. So, feels good to get the garage, that engine out of here. I did drive it around a little bit. Got it up to about 45 miles per hour. It runs fantastic. That engine has great throttle response. I was a little bit nervous that the injection pump would be bad, but it seemed to have no issues whatsoever. I actually bought a new set of rubber for it because the tires on it are the scariest tires I think I've ever driven on. I'll show you guys these cracks, look at this. Woo, that's probably, that's one of the good ones. It holds air good. 1991, but the shifting was really sloppy. So finally, after three, three and a half weeks, I finally got parts for the shifter. So we can fix some of the sloppiness in the shifter. Um, people keep saying, just go to the wrecking yard, get this stuff from the wrecking yard. These things aren't in wrecking yards, not around me anymore, maybe 10 years ago, but no. Even those parts right there, manufactured in 2013, shows you how few of these things are still people are still buying parts for them they just they're not on the road it does sound really cool it sounds like a tractor it feels like you're driving a tractor a little bit nice and rattly but got to throw some new tires on it got to fix the starter because the starter is super annoying alternator's not charging i think that's from the electrical gremlins inside let me show you ginger thinks this is a driving vehicle now so now she's ready to go on a ride all the time right ready to go for a drive you think so now all the wiring and stuff is good um, just the fuse panel is kind of rusty and crusty and so all the connections and all the fuses um, I had galvanic corrosion between because the dissimilar metals between the brass contacts and the whatever the fuses are made out of so they're all kind of corroded um, all the wiring looks good the mice didn't really chew the wiring so I think the best thing to do is just cut out that fuse box panel and just put in an aftermarket one easy enough if all the wiring is good the inside does not smell like a mouse anymore until you get the heater core warmed up 
and then it starts smelling a little funky just a little bit but I kind of knew that so I got to rip apart the dash and evacuate the mice but the heater core is not leaking which is good so there's lots of good news some bad news I've got to just just needs to be cleaned up a little bit more but one of the big things I wanted to do was get it running got to fix some just this rust hole that's like it this and one other on, on the other side because there's I don't know if I told you, there's absolutely no rust on the underneath, like none. The inside of the bed's not rusty. Like nothing's rusty besides where the mice were. So that'll be another episode. Thanks for watching, guys. Hey, Ginger, you want to go try out the new tires? You want to jump through them? Let's go jump through the new tires. How many tires you want? Two? Bye. Gotta get better uses out of them.